Kimberly Ann Amaro. Kimberly was last seen in St. John, New Brunswick, Canada on the 3rd of September, 1987. She was last seen at the Atlantic National Exhibition Fair with her sister Tammy and her friends. Her sister went home and left Kimberly with her friends. Later that evening, Kimberly's mother was at home expecting her to be back by 11 p.m., but she failed to return home. She immediately assumed that something was wrong when one of her friends came to the home looking for her. Kimberly's mom then contacted police to file a missing child report. Kimberly had initially been deemed a runaway by police, a home, as she lived in a home filled with drugs, alcohol, and possibly sexual misconduct. Many agencies continue to list Kimberly as an endangered runaway. However, the family has accused authorities of mishandling the initial investigation into her disappearance. Authorities did, however, continue to follow up leads and possible tips in the case. There have been leads that would lead the disappearance towards a more malicious explanation. Convicted serial killer Michael Wayne McGray once confessed to murdering Kimberly and burying her body on the Kingston Peninsula, which is located in between the St. John River and the Kennebeska River. Another man who would later be caught of sexually abusing and committing horrid acts against his own daughter, who went by the name of Randy Manuel, made a tape recording which detailed Kimberly's kidnapping, captivity, and subsequent murder. He also claimed he was psychic and knew the location of Kimberly's body. Manuel took his tape and left it across the street from his home. The place across the street just happened to be the fairgrounds that Kimberly disappeared from. In the tape, it was also detailed that Kimberly was killed because she attempted to escape her abductors. The, ta the tape provided specific locations such as communities and the names of roads. An address was also included in the tape, which the family followed up on. They reached the door to they went to the doorstep of the house mentioned for the tape, and a man answered the door to the family and said, I've been waiting years for this. The man apparently went on to say he had a conversation with his friends years earlier about hunting up near the Upham, and then one of them mentioned Kimberly's disappearance. In regards, this man was quoted as saying, she went in and never came out. Right in regards to Kimberly, the man was shaken by what he heard and jotted the man's name on a piece of paper and kept it in his trunk for years until the family came to him. The man was actually known to Kimberly and she had babysat for him the summer before she disappeared. For that reason, it is believed that this man was involved in Kimberly's disappearance. also worth mentioning that a cabin that was on the Altham property burnt down just one month after Kimberly's disappearance. Michelle Liza Wedge on July 2, 1975, a seven-year-old Michelle Wedge left her Moncton residence at around 8.30 p.m. on her bicycle. This was the last time Michelle would ever be seen. After search efforts ensued when she didn't turn home, 
Her bicycle was found later that evening by her brother on the southwest corner of John and Dominion Street. She was wearing navy blue shorts, socks, sandals, and a red and white t-shirt. She had brown eyes. She was slender and thin, with a light complexion and light brown hair. On the evening of her disappearance, Wedge had been left in the care of her older siblings and was riding her bike in the neighborhood. Her older brother, who was watching her, had friends over, and no one noticed that Wedge had disappeared until her sister got home at around 9 p.m. and was unable to locate Michelle. Initially, interviews with people in the neighborhood determined that Wedge was last seen at around 9.10, about 40 minutes after her brother recalled having seen her, exiting the house to play outside. Witnesses had seen her riding her bicycle north on Dominion Street near the intersection of John Street. This was just a few dozen meters from Michelle's home. In a more troubling witness testimony, someone recalled seeing a young girl getting to a car at the corner that night. Looking more into witness accounts of a little girl getting into a car, this case began as an abduction mostly based on the testimony of two young girls who said they had seen Michelle get into a car with a man who had earlier that evening tried to invite them into his vehicle. The girls gave a very detailed description of the suspect and helped produce a sketch. The suspect was described as male in his mid to late 20s with thick black hair and eyebrows, a dark complexion, a scar on the right side of his face, he had a thin mustache with a full beard and wore dark, thick-rimmed glasses. The girls also said he speaks with a strange voice. His vehicle was described as a small, dark green car with black interior. However, Moncton police were expressing doubts about the statement of these witnesses. They did find a suspect matching the witness's description. However, the suspect did not drive a green car. He was questioned and then later released. Andre Gavier. 17 year old Andre was last seen at approximately 10 15 p.m. on the eve of September 23, 1984, near Sims Corner on the west side of St. John, New Brunswick. At the time of his disappearance, he was wearing a white alpine t shirt, a brown leather jacket, and faded blue jeans. He was 5'8 and 139 pounds, he had brown hair and eyes, and he also had a lighter on him, which was engraved, Andre, July 10, 1984, Irene and Paul on the back. There is little dialogue surrounding this case, however some speculate his disappearance could be connected to another young boy who was murdered just the day before Andre disappeared. His name was John Doyle Jr. On September 22, 1984, John, who was 14, of a small New Brunswick town called Mitchell Settlement, left his residence at noon on his bicycle to go to the Jacket River. He was last seen alive between 3 and 5 p.m. that same day. On November 23, 1984, his body was discovered underneath trees that had been set on fire. His bicycle was also located at the scene. Later, autopsy had determined he had died from a fractured skull caused by severe blows to the head. However, though there is speculation about these cases being connected, the disappearance of Andre 
in the murder of John took place on opposite sides of the province, about 383 kilometers apart. So though it is possible they are connected, it does seem unlikely.